Well, if you're like me uh, or are about to attend some graduations, high school or college or maybe even grade school, we laugh about that sometimes, my friend and I, the grade school graduations. But it's a time of um, hope and wonder, thinking about um, what's ahead for our, for our graduates and what it'll be like for them. Um, in between uh, their use of technology, I try to tell my children about some of, the, uh, some of the fascinating technologies that I'm exposed to on a daily basis. And um, I even have shown them the, uh, the FTS Visions uh, document and some of the more interesting things that they can grasp there. But I think what's really difficult to convey to them is uh, the astounding pace of change which many of us have uh, weathered in our, in our careers and uh, will continue to weather and how they, can, um, how they can digest that incredible, uh, incredible pace. I think the next presentation will use uh, some fascinating examples of how that's happening now and how they might leverage that. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next keynote speaker, Mark Hatch, the CEO of TechShop. Mark is CEO and co-founder of TechShop and a recognized leader in the global maker movement. Under his leadership, tech shop revenue grew 20-fold in five years, and multiple new locations have opened across the U.S. Mark has held executive positions at a range of firms, including Kinko's, Avery Dennison, and HealthNet. In 2013, his book, The Maker Movement Manifesto, was released by McGraw-Hill Education, and San Francisco Business Times recognized Mark as one of the Bay Area's most admired CEOs. Mark has spoken at industry and leading events like SXSW Tech Techonomy, TEDx, and the Clinton Global Initiative. Please welcome Mark Hatch. Thank you very much. This is a uh, wonderful opportunity, and what, what a perfect venue for a computer company to be at. Uh, the Computer History Museum is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal place. I hope you get some time during the breaks to, to wander around. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, thank you for the introduction. It was very, uh, very gracious. Um, so I wrote the book, uh, the, the Maker Movement Manifesto, um, and what uh, you may not know, um, given we don't typically just put this right out there on my bio, is I'm also a former Green Beret. So government taught me how to run a revolution. Now, it's actually a Green Beret's job. Um, the success we had in northern Afghanistan was a direct result of that kind of training. So when I write a manifesto, I'm actually pretty serious about it. Um, we are in the middle of a revolution, and uh, it is truly going to have a remarkable impact across a wide array of uh, societal groups, uh, institutions, and organizations. And nobody had written the manifesto, so I took the opportunity to do it. I recommend it highly. Um, you can download uh, the core component, the, uh, the manifesto itself, for free uh, on our website. Um, so welcome to the revolution. Everything I thought I knew about new product development um, is now no longer true, and that's basically happened in the last five to seven years. I did new product development at Avery Dennison. I did the global new product development process, put in stage-gated new product uh, efforts, managed to crunch down time from two years uh, to, to one year. So it's been a great maker year. Uh, this stuff has happened basically all in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, MakerBot, the 3D printing company, kind of the consumer version of 3D printing. F about five years ago today, Brie Pettis, the founder of MakerBot, was still a junior high art teacher in Seattle. This last year, he sold his company to Stratasys for $600 million. What a great age we live in when a junior high art teacher can move to Brooklyn and launch a company that has remade our perception of 3D printing. 3D printing had been around for 25 years. And Brie, a junior high art teacher, comes in and completely and radically changes the entire world's view of what's going on there and got $600 million uh, for the effort. Now, he didn't get all of that personally, uh, but trust me, he's doing just fine. Um, 
Autodesk has been our biggest funder. Carl Bass, the CEO, and his senior team, uh, the CTO, uh, the CMO, and others have completely and totally embraced the maker movement. Um, our first conversation with them was, one, please give us free software because we can't afford um, to put all of your software on all our computers, and they said yes. Um, and they said, what else do you want? It's like, we'd like to have an employee of yours on site to help them use the software, and they said yes. And then we said, you know what the biggest problem in the maker space actually is this interstitial layer between the design software and the machine. It's called CAM, for those of you who may not be aware, Computer Aided Manufacturing. Well, it turns out, depending on what machine you're trying to use, you actually have a different CAM package every time. It's insane. You have one design package and a box, I used to you think, of it like, think of it like a printer, and nobody has written PostScript. Nobody has done the computer-aided manufacturing that would allow you to go for a laser cutter or a 3D printer or, or something else. So could you fix CAM? And they said, you know, that's really hard, Mark. It's actually a really difficult problem, but we'll consider it. They just spent $250 million buying one of the largest CAM companies in the world because they've come to exactly the same conclusion. This is one of the biggest problems and they intend to help solve it. Autodesk has probably spent somewhere between 300 and 500 million dollars trying to solve problems in the maker space and they've done it just in the last three years. They've been a phenomenal um, uh, boost to, um, to what's going on in the space. You see brands like Etsy and Kickstarter and Shapeways. It was nice to see that Indiegogo is going to be here later today. GE has helped fund veterans um, with us across uh, the United States. We have 500 veterans per year from them for two years. They get to come in and use the tech shop space, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, which was essentially a doubling down of something that the Veterans Administration had done with us. GE funded Quirky as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that kind of towards the end. But they had such a great experience with using Quirky at the front end of their design and development process that they essentially forced Ben to do another round. Ben wasn't looking for another round, but GE encouraged them to take an extra $80 million to kind of take his platform to the next level. Of course, Make Magazine has been spun out, which is fabulous because now it gives them an opportunity to raise funds explicitly against this space. Intel launched Galileo and Edison. Both of those products, projects came out inside of uh, six months after the new CEO stepped in. Pelosi, uh, I'm sorry, Leader Pelosi um, at a tech shop event recently said, I'm in awe of the maker movement. We've got the White House Maker Fair coming up. The, I think the announcement for the date is actually coming out today uh, sometime. It'll be in the next uh, few weeks. I believe we're going to get President Obama on the South Lawn saying some nice things about the maker movement and what's going on there. That'll be the first time we've said, he said those words um, in, a, in that kind of a forum. There are two new books out. My book. Did I mention it? <laughs> My publisher will be proud. Um, and then uh, David Lang also wrote a book called uh, Zero to Maker. David's story is absolutely remarkable. He came in and um, told me that he was writing a column for Make Magazine. And the column was going to be called Zero to Maker because he didn't know how to make anything. He says, well, Mark, that's a slight exaggeration. I'm really good at email. That's the only thing he had made in decades was a really good email. Within six months, after taking a series of about 25 classes at Tech Shop, he opened his own underwater robot company and has now got the largest open source underwater robot company on the planet. He didn't know how to make anything, and six months later, he's the co owner of a robot company. Holy cow. And he wrote a book about it called Zero to Maker. I highly recommend it, it's a fabulous read. There are two new accelerators, hardware accelerators, that have opened up. Of course, we had Lemnos Labs um, that had opened about three years ago. We had Bolt open, and then Alpha uh, Tech Gear opened this year, which means of the literally hundreds and hundreds of accelerators we have around the globe, we now have four focused on hardware. Small opportunity there, by the way, and none of them were outside of the U.S. Um, I'm sorry, one is Hexcelerate, as is, uh, uh, is in China. We've got all kinds of great partners, um, and I'll come back to a couple of these. I mentioned Autodesk already. Uh, Ford Motor Company fully funded a location for Tech Shop in um, uh, Detroit. 
Uh, National Instruments is our newest partner. We'll be deploying their software, um, their uh, LabVIEW, and um, some of their hardware, their MyDAC hardware, across the entire uh, platform. We've got a great relationship brewing with them. Intel's helped us uh, do fund our temporary move. BMW is uh, helping to fund the launch of Tech Shop Munich. Uh, this will be our first international location, uh, opening in the first quarter of uh, next year. General Electric, I've already mentioned, has done GE Garages. Uh, we're also uh, working with them, I'm sorry, vet, the Veterans Program, where we've done GE Garages with them, where we do a pop-up retail store where you can come in and have a uh, maker experience in various places in the US. So we've done um, Austin, Texas, uh, Houston, Chicago, New York, and most recently DC. We've actually got a team getting ready to go to Nigeria. Um, with, uh, with GE Garages. Lowe's Home Improvement is our first retail partner. Uh, we've co-located a, a place in Austin, Texas. Arizona State University funded a location in, um, uh, outside of Phoenix in Chandler. And then DARPA and the VA, along with GE, helped us stand up both Pittsburgh um, and DC. So we now have eight locations across the US. I like to say we're almost 1% of the way done. Um, I believe we're gonna become the Kinkos of the 21st century. 800 Kinkos when I was a, um, a manager there. Um, I fully believe we'll have 800 or more tech shops um, and the equivalent in the U.S. I'll, I'll kind of unpack that in a little bit. Uh, lots of press. Finally, people are starting to mention what, a, uh, what the maker movement is. It's my biggest problem, actually. Launching a company in an entirely new category uh, is, is a pain. Um, when, you, you know, when the first time you ever said, like, software as a service, people didn't know what you were talking about. The first time you said, what's a cloud? It's like, well, you know, you've got Cumulus and Nimbus, and no, that isn't what we're talking about. So the maker movement is an entirely new category, and whenever I say I'm, you know, I've got a maker space, I, I get blank stares. I'm hoping that that will continue to change. Tech Shop is a membership-based, do-it-yourself fabrication studio. Membership-based means for $125 a month, you get access to all of the tools of the Industrial Revolution. Let me repeat that. For $125 a month, you get all of the tools of the Industrial Revolution. So what that means is that if you can afford a Starbucks addiction, you can afford to change the world. And that is new to the world, actually, why I got involved. When uh, Jim Newton, was at a, uh, our founder, was at a party and I overheard him say it's kind of like Kinko's for geeks, um, I went over to find out what, what do you, you know, I am Kinko's for Geeks. I ran the computer services section across the U.S. Um, you know, what are you talking about? And I went and I met the people that were doing all of these amazing things and was completely blown away with how easy and cheap and fast people were making new products and being a new product guy, that was a, that was a big deal. A typical tech shop is uh, 15 to 20,000 square feet. We like to say it has every tool uh, that you need. We teach hundreds of classes a month in each location. Uh, and we have all kinds of corporate events. The events are phenomenal. Lasers and beer, welding and wine, water jet and whiskey, power tools and alcohol. What could possibly go wrong? It's phenomenal. They make, for, they make for a lot of fun events. We do a sumo robot build where you get teams upwards of, like you'll have 80 people in a room. You'll be teams of four or five, and you build these little micro robots, and they battle it out and knock one another off, and then everybody has to take a shot, or I don't know, something like that. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend doing a team building event um, on site. Our mission is to help drive global innovation by engaging, enabling, and empowering people to build their dreams. The engagement piece is really just the platform. The enabling piece is the kind of the combination of the platform and the educational layer and some other things that we do. The empowering piece is the community that develops around a tech shop. On a Friday, Saturday night in San Francisco at the tech shop, you'll have people from Levi's from their design department, Method from their design department, IDEO, Frog Design. You'll have designers from uh, Twitter and from Facebook. You'll have hardware folks. I've seen Fujitsu employees there, NASA employees. We'll have university professors all working together on their own little projects and often getting excited and helping one another out. It, it becomes the most creative community in San Francisco on, on those evenings. And you really do need to experience it. It's a remarkable thing. That's actually what happens. That's the empowering piece. So here's one of the core themes of what's going on. The tools are cheap. 
So the computer numerically controlled mill that we have, um, the software platform itself from Siemens used to cost $100,000. The hardware itself was 150,000 because of the stepper motors and all the fancy you know, chips and tool sets that you had to do. So it was a $250,000 machine just about 30 years ago. We are getting that same machine now for $18,000. This is almost like a Moore's Law thing. Now, it took 30 years to get there. That's a 90% reduction in the cost of a core tool. So that's cheap. Easy to use is the real key, though. If you wanted to make something with a mill, historically, and you didn't have access to a computer, it would take you six months to a year to get just reasonably good. You wouldn't be world class. You would not be a millwright. You could just kind of maybe do, get something uh, out of it that you want. These things are hard. That's why we send people to school for two or three years, so they can learn how to do this. You hook a computer up to that, we're teaching people how to mill in six hours. Six hours. You can learn how to make things out of steel today. Oh my gosh, that is new to the world. Now, it used to cost a quarter million dollars, and you had to have three phase, and you're not going to put that in your garage because it's too big, and you're going to have to put your urban assault vehicle somewhere else. But now you can come to Tech Shop, and for about four bucks a day, you can have access to that as well as the education. We'll teach you how to use the tool. That's new to the world. We've never been, I've never operated in a space. This has just happened in the last five years, where for four or five bucks a day, you can have access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution, and you can learn how to use them in days, not years. That changes everything. So here's some that we have. This is our CNC tool. It doesn't look that fancy, but you can do amazing things with this, like um, build uh, CubeSats, or uh, one of our members built an XPRIZE uh, lunar uh, mining robot. Another one uh, built a, um, is actually, uh, one of them was working on a fusion reactor. I wasn't too excited about that. Um, and then an another guy um, uh, was working on a, uh, actually a lunar lander, of, of all things. Um, so you don't need to have the real fancy Haas multi-tool changing things to build your prototype. You might need it in manufacturing. You may need it if you're doing really sophisticated things. But if you're trying to build a prototype, these tools are good enough. We have a water jet. We call this our sexy beast. It'll cut through five inches thick of anything on the planet. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Um, granite, titanium, steel. Pigs, cows, pizza boxes. We do our pizza boxes. Well, we've done it once anyway. Where we took the garnet out and just cut the box and then cut the slices. It was a little soggy on the sides, but it was it was fun. You got your individual slice with between two smashed pieces of cardboard. It was great. A complete textiles lab, including a computer numerically controlled quilting machine. A complete woodworking lab, including a computer numerically controlled router. Laser lab, these are uh, computer controlled. We call these our gateway drug. I'm from San Francisco, it's okay to say that out loud. The, what you are trying to design into a gateway drug, if, if you're a pusher, is that you want it to be um, easy, you want it to be powerful, and you want it to be extremely addictive. That's a laser cutter. You take this two hour class, and some people have accidentally launched businesses after taking that one $80 class. We had one guy that went from being homeless to relaunching his career by himself, completely bootstrapped, after taking this one class. So I highly recommend taking the laser cutter class as an, as an intro. It's a, it's a fabulous thing. Of course, we have 3D printers, which are also computer numerically controlled. We have close to $800,000 worth of uh, Autodesk software across uh, in each of our locations. Uh, and then we have the more traditional tools because you still need them, welding machines, uh, plastics, injection molding, which by the way, the injection molding um, back, you know, the back end is all computer controlled. Uh, Vacuform, oops, I don't want to do an update to McAfee. Little known thing, this is a, if we ever do beer, uh, one of my first investors was John McAfee. Um, back in the 80s, before he became Mr. McAfee. Um, and he hasn't changed at all, for those of you who've been tracking. He hasn't, trust me, he hasn't changed at all. He's an, ama an amazing guy, crazy. I'm kind of checking in and out here. Am I here or here? All right, I'm good here. 
uh, standard machine tools, uh, sheet metal tools, uh, large project, uh, all kinds of events, as I mentioned, but most importantly, what happens is a community uh, develops around it. So here's another thing that's happening. What we're doing is we're targeting the creative class. The creative class are about 40 million of them in the United States. They tend to aggregate in the major cities. Uh, they tend to be higher educated. They have time on their hands. So this is Clay Shirky's work out of NYU. Americans spend, it's like hundreds of billions of hours watching television a year. If we can just convert a little bit of that into creative time instead of watching television, um, we, can, we can change the world. Um, they have the money. The creative class actually controls half of all the disposable income in the United States, $470 billion, which you know they're spending on frappuccinos and urban assault vehicles. So the idea here is if we can get that creative class to spend a little bit of money doing creative things instead of watching television, what you, do, what you end up doing, this is fascinating, from a macroeconomic perspective, what we've done is we've moved money out of the disposable category into the creative category, and the cost to the economy is zero. We can innovate for free if we can get the creative class excited about the maker movement. And some of them will change the world, and actually they already have, and that'll, I'll be closing out with, with uh, those stories. What they need is the place, the people around them, then the tools to help build their dreams. Sometimes, and we, we use the word carefully, build their dreams. Sometimes they come in with a dream that's like this. It's like, no, you can do this. It's okay, you have the capacity, you have the capability, and you now have access to easy, powerful, cheap tools. You can do amazing things. And so they literally build their dream to something bigger than what it was when they first came in. So here's some member projects. And I'm on track, this is good. We'll be able to actually ha answer some questions at the end if I can keep the pace up. I often get asked, because if you go to the Maker Fair, um, what, you know, what you see is a lot of really fun and interesting things, like the Tesla coils off to the side with a million volts and the guy dancing inside of a Faraday cage and getting it hit by bolts. Um, not something that you can really scale or take home or use for anything productive, but it makes for pretty good entertainment. You know, or you go out to where all the burners are and they have that, this year they had that great big like 15 foot tall octopus firing flames out the end of its arms. Like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty wicked, that's pretty wild. And then you go through the craft area and you see the crafts and the quilting and so forth. And so I often get asked, you know, hey Mark, you know, look, your machines are interesting, but they're not real machines, I have a, Hawes multi-tool changer. I have a half a million dollar YAG laser for cutting steel, yada, yada, yada. It's like, guys, these tools are the tools of the industrial revolution. We didn't start out with YAG lasers. We didn't start out with multi-tool changers. So what have people made out of tech shop? And everything here that you're going to see has come out of the Bay Area. This is the world's fastest electric motorcycle. It did 218 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats two summers. It holds the Guinness World's Record. This last summer, it won Pike's Peak. Not only did it beat all the other electric motorcycles, it destroyed the Ducati Superbike. When was the last time you saw a race, motorcycle or automotive, where the second place finisher came in 20 seconds later? Holy cow, you want me to wait, count 20 seconds? I mean, this guy had a massage and a beer by the time the Ducati came across the line. So their objective is to become the Tesla of, uh, of motorcycles. They're actually right here uh, in the valley. Um, Andy's working on a jetpack. Um, I usually get a laugh from that, so jetpacks, yeah. Um, that is not Andy, by the way. That's a professional pilot. That pilot broke one leg and two ribs learning how to fly. Um, I don't know, as a former Green Beret, that seems like a small price to pay to fly. I mean, wow. Uh, I asked Andy, you know, uh, what, why are you working on a jetpack? He says, well, you know, Mark, Popular Mechanics, 19, September 1974, there was a jetpack on the cover. I was promised a jetpack, and Boeing's not working on it, and General Motors isn't working on it, and NASA, well, they're doing their space packs, but they're not really thinking terrestrial, so I'm working on a jetpack. And he's serious. It helps that he's a multimillionaire and he's got a little bit of time on his hands. 
Now, what was really funny about this story is um, that when I gave this basic presentation to the folks at NASA, I was getting a lot of these, you don't have big boy tools, and the people, and then they were responding to Andy, and the people you have in here are crazy. <laughs> it's like, I don't know that we want our NASA employees hanging out with people building jet packs. Um, until they met Andy, which they happened to, like 30 minutes later, we go walking past his uh, little office in San Jose, and inside of his office is a full spacesuit with a space jet pack on the back, quarter million dollars on, on eBay, and they stop right there. It's like, what in the world is that? It's like, well, that's Andy's workspace. You know, which part of he's serious about jet packs didn't you understand? If you're an engineer, and I suspect most of you in here are, you look at the prior art, and if you can get your hands on the prior art, you do, and you decompose it, and you recompose it, and you analyze what's going on. And so he said, that's what he's doing. He's looking, he's looked, you know, he's torn this thing apart, re put it back together, he knows exactly what kind of technology you're using. And at that moment, I couldn't have timed it. Uh, Andy comes around the corner, he's got a little device in his hand, and I introduce him to the NASA folks, and they, they geek out for a while on who the astronaut was and how much dwell time outside of the space station the, the, uh, the pack had. And then finally, uh, Andy goes, oh, let me tell you about this. This is an air nozzle, and I used a 3D printer. This is, like, this is about a dollar's worth of material, maybe 20 minutes of time. And this air nozzle, because I, you know, I do Venturi stuff, this is like eight times more effective than the nozzles you guys are using or that I've used historically. You guys are using 3D printers to do this, right? Not so much. So Andy's actually now a consultant to NASA. So when you go to the Maker Faire, you'll actually see him behind the counter talking about space packs and, and CubeSats and their most recent one, which is uh, chipsats, which are, are, are really cool. Um, yeah, he's a serious entrepreneur. He's doing serious work, and actually the government is now engaged in some of the work that he's doing out of our little maker space. Um, these are CubeSats. This was another, the same, the same event, um, again, they were, they, they were saying, we don't really think the NASA employees would use this space. We have our, our own tools and they've got access to it. Now they have to fill out the forms and they have to you know, put in the appropriate department codes and, and, and yada, 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 and you, and you better not use the tools if you haven't got authorization from your boss or the spending authority or whatever, but they have access to it. And then sure enough, they come around the corner and there is a NASA employee with all of his badges in glory working on a CubeSat uh, with a, a local college, and they, you know, it's like, why are you doing this here? And it's like, well, the CubeSat program is funded by NASA at the top level, but I don't actually have a budget to use our tools internally, so I just come here. So this is the interesting thing. Again, innovation for free. For 125 bucks a month in materials, he doesn't need NASA's infrastructure to do CubeSats. Anybody can who has the knowledge, and that's, again, that's, that's new to the world. And we'll talk about Ford here in a little bit. Uh, this is uh, Danny, I, I love him. Um, uh, it was between his junior and senior year in high school, I uh, went to his parents, said, uh, buy me a Segway, I really need a Segway. They were really sexy at that time. Um, and uh, they said, no, of course not, we're not gonna spend $8,000 to get the 17 year old a Segway. Um, then he said, well, how about if you give me a membership to Tech Shop and a materials budget and I'll make my own? And that's what he did over the summer. He built his own Segway. I mean, holy cow, this is, there's a gyro stack involved, all the electronics, aluminum, that's aluminum, aluminum welding. Um, wow, really talented kid. Uh, and then in my mind, he upgraded it. So that on, on, the, on the right here, that is the world's first two-wheeled, 17-mile-an-hour, self-balancing, wait for it, bar stool. Yeah, baby. That's what I need is a bar stool. I can't fall off. <laughs> and will outrun a cop on his feet. It's brilliant. There's another interesting thing about Danny. He got into MIT and didn't go. Because he felt that he wanted to start businesses and create jobs for his peer group when they got out of MIT with $200,000 in debt, and he's doing it. He's done two Kickstarter campaigns. His most recent one raised $800,000. He spooled his involvement in the startup community in San Francisco. He and some friends now lease to own eight mansions in San Francisco where they're 
they're hosting and starting all kinds of companies. And he wouldn't have been scheduled to graduate yet. He's got another year to go before he would, he would graduate. Most MIT students don't have eight mansions and haven't raised $800,000 on Kickstarter. Most of them are going to have to go get a job. We have a lot of artists that come in and use the space, uh, which is great. Um, this was a, a, a major installation in uh, downtown San Francisco. Um, you know, the rumor is that artists, um, you know, have to bleed for their work and put in their time and so forth. Well, one of the reasons is because they don't always do their math. Uh, so they submitted a design for a $5,000 grant. One, they were elated, and then they went out to the engineering studio and said, how much is it going to cost to make? $7,000. That's what it means to suffer for your art. You sell it for less than what it costs to make it. So they came to Tech Shop, figured out how to use the tool. We taught them, and they did it for three grand. So they actually made money instead of losing money. It was a 60% reduction in, uh, in cost. This one's a, one of my favorite. I've got too many favorites, but this is one of my favorites. Tina is one of those accidental entrepreneurs I mentioned earlier. She took the laser cutter class. We encourage you then to, um, you know, it's pedago basic pedagogy. If you learn a new skill, you need to practice it within 48 hours, otherwise you start losing it quickly. So she scheduled two days later a time to come in to use the laser cutter, but she didn't know what she was going to make and got a call from her, um, uh, her in-laws and said, hey, you know, little Bobby's going to have a birthday party on Saturday. We're doing cupcakes and, you know, a pinata. Uh, you know, Bobby really wants you to come. And so she said, oh, great. Glad to hear you're doing cupcakes. What are all of the kids' names? I use my time for the laser cutter on Friday to cut out their names out of bamboo, and I'll, I'll give each of the kids a cupcake topper with their name on it. And what nine-year-old kid doesn't want to see their name physically instantiated in something? Like, none. They all want that. Interesting dilemma occurs towards the end of the birthday party. All the kids are there, the parents show up, say, hey, you know, look at my little cupcake topper, isn't that cool? Mom is like thrilled and then has a little consternation moment. I'm glad Bobby's got a cupcake topper, but I got two kids at home. They don't have cupcake toppers. Tina, how much are your cupcake toppers? It's like, uh, I don't know, 20 bucks. Okay. She came away with $400 in orders. Accidentally. She had no intention of selling cupcake toppers. She was just doing a little craft project for her, her nephew. But then, you know, like there's, a, there's this algorithm that then kicked in, right? So she sold, I don't know, what does that work out to? 20 cupcake toppers. And then some of those kids had birthday parties and she got a call. And so then she did multiple birthday parties. And then each of those spawned into other birthday parties. She started coming in, like in all of her spare time to be able to use the laser cutter, eventually launched an Etsy store, got a spotlight on uh, Martha Stewart for the quality of the product that she's doing, um, and has now does, has done a DVD on how to do um, Etsy stores. Her, uh, her technical background, she's a labor organizer. No technical skills whatsoever. And I don't know how well she's doing, but when she got married, this is a couple years ago, right about the time she started uh, doing these, uh, they couldn't afford to go on a honeymoon. Um, they just couldn't afford, the, not the, not, they had the time, they didn't have the money to go on a honeymoon. So the last time I, I saw her, I said, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. I said, yeah, that's because I just got back from my honeymoon. We took six months and went around the world. Cupcake toppers. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, we have all kinds of venture-backed uh, folks. Uh, uh, this one is called uh, Apritech, and I love this thing, um, which is why I put it in my deck. I always want to make sure that the automotive folks see this. So not only does this tell you that your tire is low, you know, I've got two cars, uh, um, newer cars. I've got a, uh, a nice BMW and a nice Ford um, Flex, and both of them will tell me when the tire's low. Why? Fix it. Pump it up. You have the technology embedded in there that tells me that it's low. You can't tell me, I've got enough energy in this thing. I can drive this thing through a house. Surely it can compress air. Sure, certainly you can create something that will blow the, I, I don't want to know that the tire's low. I just want you to fix it, right? This device does. So it's something that goes into the hub. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's, it's tied in. It's like if you have a low tire, it pumps it up and it's embedded in the wheel. So you don't have that stupid light ever go off again. 
Um, I think they've raised like $10 million in venture money, and they look to save a typical fleet um, 2 to 3% of their annual fuel cost, uh, because low tires are things that kind of get, uh, get left in the dark. Uh, we've had an entire 3D printing company launch uh, accidentally out of our San Francisco uh, facility. These guys bought a bunch of the early uh, maker bots, and um, uh, <laughs> Bree's initial attempts weren't all that good. The heads tended to jam. They used really poor materials that tended to wear too quickly, and so these engineers came in and fixed all of those and then started showing off what they were doing, and then people started saying, can I buy them from you? It's like, we don't have a company. Maybe we better form a company so we can sell these. And so they've actually launched an entire uh, company out of it. It was originally just a, a robot club. Um, Karen Snyder uh, is uh, one of our early entrepreneurs. Um, all she did was cut holes in bamboo. This is a knitting needle gauge. If you're into knitting, ne needles come in different widths and, and so forth. And I'll give you the short version of this story. Um, she quit her six-figure-a-year program analyst job at a major software company because she was making more money on Etsy and eBay selling tchotchkes into the um, knitting industry than she was making um, uh, as a professional. One class. At the time, it was a $60 class. This is, the, this is what happens when you, uh, you, know, you get lifestyle funding through either a Kickstarter or a, uh, an Indiegogo. So Max was a designer by training. And um, he got a really great job, in a sense, at, I think it was The Gap or one of those, Macy's, one of the retailers in town. And, but he was young and he was new, and so you know, he's on the bottom rung. And so he got to design fixtures, you know, angle brackets, shelving. Now, after four years of design school, does that sound like a fun way to spend your week designing fixtures? And, and just to think, like, you're going to get to do this for the next three years while you wait for somebody to move on or retire so that you can move up to, I don't know, lighting fixtures? I, I don't know. It's, for a designer, that's not an exciting job. And so he said, forget it. Um, I'm going to do something on the side. Came in, and uh, he's, he's a designer. He doesn't do production. So he would never used a laser cutter. So he learned how to use a laser cutter. And this has got a living hinge. It's made out of cherry. He used Tyvek. And then he took the Arduino class. And this is remarkable. If you're reasonably bright, you can teach yourself how to program an Arduino and their online codes where you can just like cut and paste. I say give it two weeks. If you've never coded before, just spend a couple hours a night for two weeks. And at the end of that, you'll be able to turn light switches on. You'll be able to grab data from a sensor and port it through a computer and make it go somewhere else. I mean, you can do really remarkable things with it. Actually, you can simulate what a embedded processor will do without having to learn the code for doing an embedded processor. So that's what he did, was he, he wanted to be able to turn the lamp on when you opened it. Um, and he knew he was going to have to go to embedded processors eventually. But what he wanted to do was demonstrate that it would work um, and launch a Kickstarter campaign. So I met him. Um, uh, he was out on the, uh, out on the desks. And um, I asked him, you know, what are you doing? Because the lamp is beautiful. I'll show it to you in just a second. Um, and he says, well, I'm going to do, do a Kickstarter campaign now, and I'm gonna, I'm, I need to raise $60,000. Ooh. The average hardware, the ad average successful hardware ask is $2,500. 60 grand puts you in the top 10%. Uh, is there any way to do it for less? And he pulls out his Gantt chart. This guy that did his homework. He pulled out his Gantt chart, and he says, you know, this is what the design's going to cost me. This is what the material's going to cost. I need to sell... Um, I think it was 600. I need to sell 600 of these at 100 bucks a pop. I need 60 grand. Um, and there's no other way to get it. I can't, I, I, you know, the minimum order quantities are such that this is what I've got to do. It's like, okay, good luck, Max. 60 grand. Do a really good video because that's one of the keys, right? Well, yeah. Is that beautiful or what? He raised $480,000. Yeah, there's a manufacturing guy over there. Oops! He had a plan, a Gantt plan, to make 600. <laughs> and he got 4,800 orders. Um, I don't know, they say that's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem if you're trying to make, make people happy. He did, actually. Eventually, he uh, flew to China, immediately set up a manufacturing facility, and, uh, and he's in production. The company's name, I sell 10 of these at every one of these events. So it's, it's Lumia. L-U-M-I-O, they're about 140 bucks each. 
I ended up having to buy one for my kid and just loved it so much. Um, but when did we live in a, you know, f 10 years ago, you're a 23-year-old designer at Gap and you need $60,000 to start, start your lifestyle business. Where do you go? Family and friends, that's it. Actually, reaching out beyond that is probably, at the time, illegal. That's been changed. But now you go to Kickstarter and you're up and running. It's like they said, nobody knows you're a dog on the internet. Nobody knew that Fukuba was a 17-year-old kid when they uh, gave him 60 grand to do a little um, an iPhone thing. You know, they see the design, they see the quality of it, and they give you the money, 480 grand. He's off, off and running. Anton um, uh, Willis, this is a, uh, well, so I see Anton, he's out on the tables, and he's wrestling with a 12-foot piece of plastic. I mean, it's just like, see, he's folding it over, and it's popping back, and it's not working well, and, and it's, it's quite the sight. So I go over to Anton, I go, what are, you know, hi, I'm Mark, who are you? Uh, he says, you know, I'm, I'm Anton, goes, what are you doing? He's like, I am building the world's first collapsible canoe. And my initial thought was, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard of. You know, maybe if you're competing with the leaky boat company, somebody will buy the collapsible canoe. Like, this is no, I call it Oro Kayak. It's for people who have small cars or small, um, uh, small apartments, and they want to have a 12-foot kayak, but they don't have a place to store it. It's man portable. It's only going to be 25 pounds, yada, yada, yada. Again, I was not a believer. It's like, yeah, whatever, you know, collapsible canoe. You're not going to get me in one of these things. You know, I don't like my boats to collapse. Um, conceptually or not. Uh, so he launched, again, he was looking for, I think he was looking for $80,000 on Kickstarter, and he raised a similar kind of number, $480,000. His company's off and running. REI wants to carry it. He's not quite at the volume yet. He set up manufacturing down in Southern California. And again, this is another, this is another guy who's in his early 20s, has no really record of launching companies, and is off and running, has got, and now owns his own company. It's true, you know, again, a remarkable story. I like to say that you can run through your own personal industrial revolution in 90 days, right? It took uh, European and America 150 years. Um, it took uh, Japan, what, 50 years, 75 years. It took the Tigers 25 or 30. You can go through your own personal industrial revolution in 90 days. Sam did. Now, he's a little bit of an overachiever. He built a lunar mining robot as his very first maker project. This guy's crazy. He used Arduino because he'd never coded before. He used our mill, uh, the CNC mill because he'd never done milling before, but he could do the software piece. Now, he was a bright guy. He was a chemist by training, but he had never made anything physically, uh, you know, probably other than beakers and stuff. I just actually saw Roy yesterday. Uh, remote controlled video conference telepresence robot. I'll pick up the pace. This is a desktop diamond manufacturing device. Let me repeat that. Desktop diamond manufacturing. So the staff says, you got to meet this guy. So I go over and say, hey, Mike, um, you know, I'm Mark. What, what are you doing? It's like desktop diamond manufacturing. I kind of giggle. It's like, he says, oh, no, it's really easy. <laughs> it's really, yeah. No, I know you're crazy. Uh, good or bad, I'm not sure yet. But easy and diamond desktop doesn't go together. All right, you know, I'll bite. How does it work? He says, oh, 95% hydrogen in my vacuum chamber here. Hydrogen. What's the first image that comes into your mind with hydrogen in enclosed spaces? Hindenburg, right? So here he is. I take two steps back. It's like, yeah, I put 95% hydrogen in here. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and I put 5% methane. It's like, okay. <laughs> Under enormous amounts of pressure. What? And diamonds fall out. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, it turns out he's got a PhD in material science and chemistry. He's started, started two diamond tool deposition companies in the last 30 years, took one of them public. And if somebody's going to create a desktop diamond manufacturing device, this is the guy I would bet on. And instead of spending $300,000, which is what he had been, somebody had given him an estimate for, he spent three grand to pursue his dream. Three grand. And that's the conversation. It's like, why didn't you do this before? It says, Mark, for $300,000, I can get a lot of rounds of golf in. <laughs> and I won't piss my wife off. For three grand, I can skip the golf. My wife doesn't even necessarily know. 
and I'm off and running pursuing my dream. When you can pursue your dream for one, two, or three percent of what it used to cost, you do. Patrick was another one of our successes. I want to be sure to leave enough time. Um, so I'll give you the short version of this. 90 days from the time he came in and asked, what classes do I need to take, to having sold a million dollars in product. He had a million dollars in the bank in 90 days. This is an iPad case made out of bamboo and, uh, and book binding. He took three classes, spent about $1,000 all in. He did $30 million in sales last year. He's got his own manufacturing facility up in Dogpatch. And the President of the United States uses his product. You can go through your own industrial revolution in 90 days. We have proof points. People have done it. But none of the ones I've showed you have changed the world. Uh, these have. So you're familiar with Square, right? Famously, we're in the valley. Those are the original three prototypes that James McKelvey built at Tech Shop in Menlo Park about four years ago. What's interesting about this is that without the prototype, the 10 smartest investors on the planet turned them down. They then built the prototype, went back, and the 10 smartest investors gave them 50 bucks each just to see the demo. It's the first time I've ever heard of a company charging the VC to see the demo. And they kept all 500 bucks and then raised 10 million. Uh, they've got a $5 billion valuation, 1,000 employees. They'll do $60 billion in transactions last year. And there are a couple of things you've got to wait for. James's ex previous experience, now he'd been a coder a couple decades ago, but for the last decade, James has been pursuing his passion as a glass blower in St. Louis. So we can thank a glass blower in St. Louis for taking the classes he needed to learn how to make something that has completely upended the merchant banking industry in the United States. Thank God, actually. Because now anybody with a checking account can get can use Amex, Discover, or credit, other, other credit cards. Whereas before, you had to give them financial statements and three years of bank records and personal guarantees. Not anymore, thanks to a glass blower in St. Louis. Our estimate, internal estimate, is that the Tech Shop platform has created over $10 billion in value in the last five years. It's created thousands of jobs with hundreds of millions of dollars in annual salaries. And our total investment to date is about $26 million. What happens when you give the tools of the Industrial Revolution to the creative class? They change the world. That was one. This is the world's most efficient data cooling center system. I actually recommend that one of you folks hunt these guys down. They're local. Um, they won a head-to-head -head competition uh, that the Department of Energy set up, and they were proven to be more efficient than um, Emerson and IBM's uh, liquid-cooled server cabinet. Phil and Bob beat IBM. Phil and Bob's investment was 20 grand in two years. I have no idea how many millions of dollars IBM or Emerson built on it. Emerson immediately licensed their technology. This is a nitrogen detection device that figures out how much fertilizer is in the ground already before you plant and before you fertilize so that you don't over-fertilize, which has created an 8,500 square mile dead zone at the end of the Mississippi. They've raised over $20 million in venture funding. These guys won a Social Entrepreneur of the Year award by Fast Company. It's a stove um, that's incredibly efficient, reduces carbon emissions for little camp stoves, and charges your electronics. This is the world's cheapest drip irrigation system. And then this is a blanket. It came out of the D-School, um, um, which is fabulous. We have a good relationship with the D-School. But when they graduate, they don't get to keep using the tools. And so historically, what that meant is even if you were building a phase-changing polymer-based papoose blanket that's on track to save 100,000 babies' lives, you graduate in June, and you go get a job somewhere else. You don't pursue your dream because you don't have the hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take to build the prototype. Not anymore. They came in, sat down, and built their prototype. Most importantly, interactions within the community improved this 16-fold, and it was donated to the team by a professional in the community. That's what happens when you get a community of creatives working together. So that was actually six different things that have changed the world. I'm going to turn, turn it uh, a little bit 
because um, you're saying, how does this, you know, how does this impact me? You know, those are all really cool stories. So this is all about open. Um, parts of it are crowd and so forth. So this is a DARPA challenge. So um, you know, the, the DARPA program officer that was running this it gave me a little chart. You know, it was like one of these, you know, it's like you know, from, from here to here. You know, the, the first Jeep took six months and a couple hundred thousand dollars to build and the aircraft, the first, uh, the first jet was X million. And we're currently on a trajectory that by, it was like 2030, the entire GDP of the United States will be spent on building one platform. Obviously, that's not going to happen. But what, how are we going to break it? And so his idea was, let's try open innovation. So here was the construct. An entirely new platform in under a year instead of 10, and for a million dollars instead of a billion. There it is. They did it. An entirely new platform from the ground up. Crowdsourced, crowd designed, then local motors built it for them. And supposedly the army won't give the prototype back. They're then working on taking it up a level, right? They got, they got pushbacks, like that was just a car. <laughs> I don't know, last time I checked, making cars are hard. Um, so this is the challenge that they're working on now. It's an entire fighting vehicle. And their objective is to do it in three years for under $5 million. Holy cow. So uh, uh, Ford funded the location in Detroit, and the key metric that, that um, uh, is known is uh, their objective was to increase the number of patents, high-quality patents coming into their patent office. And we were targeting 10 to 15 percent. So you know, they put in millions of dollars to help us open a tech shop in town. And in under two years, they saw a 100 percent increase in high-quality patentable ideas coming into their office. This guy's won awards now internationally on how amazingly he's been managing his patent portfolio. But licensing is actually a pr pretty big deal. Um, they've already they've gotten, and this is the other thing, is that anybody can innovate. So his idea here was, um, you know, we, we have 10,000 engineers, only a small portion of which are actually in R&D. Most of them are in operations, and actually a lot of them have gotten bored in operations. And they're in marketing and sales and field support and so forth. But we still have them, mechanical engineers on staff. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow open R&D. I'm just going to open a facility that anybody can use. So I mean, the reason they came for it is because they wanted to make automobiles, not because they wanted to be field sales. But they ended up in field sales because they've been working on the left turn signal for like five years. It's like, that's boring. I need to move on. So he built a facility where anybody can come in. Innovate. And sure enough, they've got a marketing guy who was, in, uh, was an engineer decades ago come in and build something that's probably going to make it on the car. If it does, that will pay for the entire experiment by itself. Actually, the licensing stream that they've created out of this is going to completely pay for it in spades, which is why they're interested in helping us open in Aiken and in Brazil and a couple of other locations. But this is the one that's, that, that blew me away most recently. Uh, Beth Comstock has been an early and, uh, a, uh, advocate of the maker movement. She helped fund the Quirky uh, investment. Um, and, and what she's done is essentially she's using the crowd to create the specification to then go build. And then she's using the crowd to identify that, there, that we don't need to do a test market because we've done the test market during the design phase. So there's no regional rollout. We're going to try it in Peoria, and we're going to do it in Chicago. No, it's straight to production. Holy cow. What happens when you do that? Well, what happens when you do that is in October of last year, she got together with the team at the appliances division, which she was now doing new products for, and said, what do you want to, you know, what, what's, what could really move the dial here? I said, well, air conditioners. Like, we do, we do a lot of air conditioners. Like, OK. Um, What's, your, what's one of the harder problems? Like, well, in-window air conditioners are, are, are pretty hard. Um, you know, and they're very competitive, yada, yada, yada. It's like, OK, let's do that. They launched in October, the design part. They launched in October. I'm, November, I'm sorry. They talked in October. They launched it in November. It's like, OK, we're going to do an in-window air conditioner. You can buy this at Best Buy today. You know, when I grew up in new product development, there were these case studies and the Harvard business folks and yada, yada. Wheelwright and Clark, I think it was 1984, had the seminal uh, piece that said, if your new product is delayed by six months, you're going to lose half of the profitability over the life of that product. 
if your product is delayed by six months, GE's gonna put you out of business. They launched an entire platform that didn't even exist in November. Went through the entire design process, built the facility to be able to produce it in volume, and they're shipping in volume. Totally lapsed time, something like seven months. Holy cow, it would take me seven months to do the design parameters. I mean, that's normal. You got your anthropological studies, you got to get ideas time, you got to do all this other work. Now, the world has changed. When you can use the crowd to do the design spec and you have a professional engineering and manufacturing capability and you have the confidence to know that because you used a crowd to prove there was a market, you just do it. Sounds like Steve Jobs, right? Sounds like somebody who's like, here's what the customer wants. I'm going to go manufacture it. I'm going to manufacture it in volume. And when I make the announcement the iPhone is available, it's available now. That is amazing. So my encouragement to you, and then we'll ask some questions, is how do you radically change? Remember, I'm a radical, right? We started that at the beginning. How do you radically change your new product development process? And I know some things are really hard and, it's, and you can't change those. But there are other parts of your business, there are other parts of the way you're coming at the design, there are other parts of the way you're going to market that have fundamentally changed. And if you're not using the engineers in marketing and sales and finance to do some of your research and development work, you should consider it because you can get some really good ideas out of these brains. And it's not as expensive as it used to be. G's actually built an entire factory in Louisville right next to their plant to do exploration around how to take this idea to the next level. Spending millions. Now, it's nowhere close to what Autodesk has spent, but they're getting there. So here's a personal challenge. You know, Got it here somewhere. Um, I bought a 3D printer because I had to, right? I'm in this space. And um, uh, maybe I left it down there. Um, and so I go, uh, I get 3D printer, I have to do a test print, and I don't know what to do, so I go on invent, um, uh, in, invent you know, was, uh, I, got, I go online, I grab a, a rose, and I print it out. And the reason I grabbed a rose is my wife had developed an allergy to roses about five years ago, and I hadn't given her a rose in five years which for a guy sucks. You, the 14th, you know, February 14th, you can at least get to the grocery store, grab a, you know, a bunch of roses, even at 10 o'clock at night, come in and, and you're good to go, right? Not for me anymore. I had gotten into the Tiffany's thing and that was really expensive. Um, but what happened, I, I downloaded the rose, printed it out, clean, you know, cleaned it up. My wife came home and says, hey babe, haven't given you a rose in, in five years. Here's a rose. Hero. She perceived it as I made it for her. That was her take on it. Now, for me, it was a test print. <laughs> so I got a lot more out of it than I was expecting. It's like, here's my test print. Um, you know, hey, babe, that was wonderful. Glad you thought of me, yeah, 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 yeah. So here's the challenge. I'd like you to make something for somebody else and give it, give it to them. Um, you know, sometime between now and the end of the year. Christmas is a good time to do that. And then I want you to, to, to contemplate the difference between a Tiffany's rose plastic that you designed, developed, and gave away. And it is a fundamentally different experience. And what's in interesting is what happens when you invite your customers to come in and in what it is that they're making. So I'll take just a few questions. Um, I've got like three, four minutes. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a wonderful talk. Can you comment on how you see the evolution of, you mentioned four hardware incubators yep. versus what you're trying to achieve where do you go long term? Where do they go long term? What are the different roles you see? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really completely different, but that's a great question. So um, these hardware accelerators are looking for big hits, $100 million companies, um, and they're finding them because there's nobody else looking for them right now. Um, they're, the, the pipeline that they're building is remarkable. The rocket space got this afternoon, and they're doing some amazing work. Their cutoff is $100 million. You have to have a $100 million program, otherwise I invite you in. Um, you know, there's no exit for doing knitting needles. Um, but there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs available for that. 
And so I, we consider ourselves the kinkos of uh, the 21st century. Anybody can come in and use it, whether you're trying to become a big company or not. They troll our spaces all the time. I mean, uh, uh, Dunk, Duncan's come through and says, hey, you know, who's interesting and, and why? Um, so we're just part of a broader ecosystem. Good question. How many members do you have in tech shop altogether? And what percentage would you consider as successful entrepreneurs? All the members. Yeah, oh, great question. Uh, so, uh, we have 6,000 members currently. Um, we average 800 to 1,000 participation. We have, my guess is, another 6,000 members who aren't paying us at the moment because they don't have a project. But as soon as they have a project, they'll come back. So we see people cycle in and cycle out, and there's no penalty um, uh, for doing that. And then um, my favorite answer to the, you know, uh, how many people are successful, the inverse is like how many people fail, and the answer is none of them fail. It's called an education. Failure is when you take venture capital, spend $2 million, and it doesn't work. Spending $2,000 of your own money learning how to use a mill and launching a company that doesn't work, that's called an education. So I consider all of our members successes. They may not be making money on what they're currently making, but if they try at it enough times, they probably will. Patrick was ph phenomenal. I went up to him and I asked him, you know, how would you describe yourself? Because he was killing it within like 30 days of, of coming. And he says, Mark, the way I would describe myself right now is I'm a failed entrepreneur. Like, what? He says, yeah, you don't understand. It's May. I've started four companies this year already. This is the only one that seems to be working. I started eight last year and none of them worked. I don't know, that looks like success to me, you know. $60 million in sales probably this year. Uh, so it's a cheap education, really. Next question. Thank you, Mark. I always enjoy your stories of ordinary people getting empowered to do extraordinary things. Um, as Kimar San mentioned in his opening uh, remarks, kind of went through the history. We've gone from artisan culture to kind of a mass production culture where everything's mass produced and mass consumed and it's a lot of clones made by robots and people that work like robots. <laughs> and now it's, you know, we're kind of, I think, coming back to our roots and just curious, you know, because we're making things that matter more to us, it's more the creative process. Right. Making them, there's value just in the making part. Right. And I think economically, what does it mean when we're making less of more? Yeah, I think this feeds into some of Fujitsu's strengths, actually. Um, the, um, the ability to do design and development on the cloud um, rather than on a local PC is phenomenal. I can do much more with it. Um, the way that Fujitsu is inserting robots into the manufacturing line right next to uh, humans and kind of re reducing the amount of time it takes to set a line up, the knowledge required, and so forth. So I, I believe, I don't think we'll get there 100%, but I believe we have a long way to go yet where we'll be able to automate a lot of these things. And that collaborative piece that was in that, that, up, that box over here where you're collaborating with customers, and you're collaborating with the designers, is I want mine this way, I think is a, is a phenomenal outcome. And it's something that Fujitsu is uniquely positioned to be able to leverage. Um, question that wasn't asked was, you know, are we doing anything uh, with Fujitsu? We're in really early discussions uh, with, uh, with Sasso-san and the team. As I just mentioned, we're really excited about what the cloud could do for a platform like TechShop, and we hope to do some other things uh, with Fujitsu in the future. So thank you very much. So if I could summarize that, you're telling me that in the 90s when I was at a company and we bet the entire company on the cost of injected mold, injection molded tooling, things have changed. And my, <laughs> and my investment in uh, learning Pascal, that was wasted. <laughs> now I know where to send the kids for the summer and hope they can support me. Make something for the wife, that's on the list, right? And. Uh, and to be a failed entrepreneur, that sounds pretty good to me right now. Thank you, Mark. That was a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to flex the schedule a little bit. Uh, we'll go to a break now. I think our agenda has us returning at uh, 1055. If we can return at 1105, um, I'll see you back here then. We have refreshments. Uh, 
uh, refreshments outside the doors, restrooms behind us, and uh, in the foyer. So thanks very much. We'll see you at 11.05.